we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Marshall Huang, and I'm a first year resident here at the Moran Eye Center. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Y. T. Wong um, here as a grand round speaker this morning. Uh, Dr. Wong is a investigator at the National Eye Institute and has been involved in numerous studies related to diseases such as macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and macular telangiectasia. Um, he has also been the primary investigator, the principal investigator in several NEI-led trials, including the landmark AREDS2 trial. He has a particular interest in the role of microglia and, the, and how it impacts age-related neuroinflammation. Um, today, he'll be presenting on clinical findings in macular degeneration um, and the current clinical interventions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wong. Thanks, Michael. Good morning. Um, thanks very much for having me. I, it's my first visit here at, in Salt Lake City, so really looking forward to learning more about the department and uh, visiting. I've, I've known colleagues for a long time. Uh, they have done great work here. Um, so um, this will be a treat for me to see how it's done in your own backyard. So this morning, I'll, I'll share some um, um, findings from not our lab, which I'll talk about in the afternoon, uh, but perhaps from our clinics, um, in which we at NEI are trying to um, find out basic mechanisms in the lab and and we have the opportunity there to translate some of these findings into perspectives um, in the clinic and to design the clinical trials for interventions uh, in diseases for which treatment is still um, wanting. So today um, I will focus on um, a disease that's uh, probably familiar to a lot of you, um, geographic atrophy um, in AMD. Um, so I'll start by um, talking, uh, perhaps for the sake of the residents, uh, what is geographic atrophy and where in the spectrum of AMD um, does GA feature. Um, I'll get into some of the details about the clinical features of GA, how does GA arise in the first place, how is it born, uh, and also how does it progress, how does it grow with time, and can these clinical observations um, looked at carefully uh, give rise to some ideas about uh, how um, the process may be driven and how it should be studied in the lab. And um, so this will lead to some of the mechanisms that we can think about, about how GA comes about and how it progresses. Um, and this might then open the door uh, towards a search for uh, new treatments for GA. Um, and I'll review at the end some of the recent strategies and approaches uh, that have been taken. Of course, uh, the, the treatment, the disease does not have a treatment right now, so this will be uh, things that have been tried and uh, have not worked. Um, so to begin, um, just to kind of um, say what is obvious to everyone in the room, um, AMD is a common eye disease with a large negative impact on um, healthy vision, and this is global. And although um, the prevalence of disease in different um, parts of the world and different ethnic groups are quite diverse, uh, this graph shows that um, regardless of uh, um, location, uh, the rate of early AMD, the prevalence of AMD increases with aging, uh, so that across the entire world, uh, when you hit your 70s and 80s, the prevalence is actually quite uh, significant uh, and occupies a significant fraction of the population. And the similar trend is also seen uh, with uh, late AMD. So as a result, uh, this, these authors have estimated that about 200 million people around the world uh, come 2020 will be affected by AMD. And with the aging population, that's um, it's gonna edge towards 300 million around the world. So AMD is indeed a significant threat to healthy vision. Um, and to um, put GA in the overall context, we can think about um, um, AMD as a disease of, of stages, and this is why I tell my fellows uh, when I speak to them about AMD in the first place, uh, I'll remember that uh, all the stages of AMD. Um, and it, when we are 17, of course, uh, our fundus looks great. Um, it uh, is devoid of any kinds of deposits, uh, anatomically perfect. Uh, but uh, with time and with uh, exposure, some of us, not all of us, develop a science of intermediate and early AMD. And this takes the form of deposits that form underneath the RP layer in the form of large soft drusen, and also uh, above the RP layer in the subrenal space in the form of pseudo-reticular drusen. Uh, these patients uh, do not demonstrate much symptomatology. Um, they may have slightly decreased visual acuity or some decreased dark irritation. Uh, but on the whole, they are quite functional and may not even know that they have uh, intermediate AMD. So the significance of this disease, um, this stage, is that it puts one at increased risk of progressing to the late forms that do cause the loss of central vision. Uh, and you're familiar, of, of course, with the progression to the late uh, exudative or wet form in which blood vessels grow from the retina, uh, from the choroid into the retina, 
and these blood vessels um, demonstrate exudative behavior that causes structural disruption and functional loss. And the other way that um, uh, intermediate AMD can progress is towards the um, late atrophic form or GA, which is uh, what we are going to be speaking about today. There's no ex um, exudative or neovascular process, but instead there is a loss of a retinal substance um, as characterized by the GA lesion. So in laying out all these um, stages of AMD, one can perhaps um, think about uh, in a kind of in a compartmentalized way, uh, what are the targets for AMD treatment and where are we now? It would be wonderful if we can nip uh, the process in the bud and stop the formation of drusen in the first place. Uh, and as you know, um, there is no current way that we can do this successfully. We cannot prevent the formation of drusen. Uh, in the ERITS trial, um, the ERITS supplementation in the form of um, uh, antioxidants and zinc uh, was actually given to patients without any drusen. And in the course of that study, uh, it was shown that um, compared to the placebo group, the rate of formation of drusen was not changed by ERITS supplementation. So when, when you guys are pro uh, su uh, providing supplements to patients, um, it's, it's perhaps clear to, it's good to communicate that this does not prevent the formation of drusen. So as a result, we do not prescribe uh, arid supplementation to people without drusen. And what about um, people who do have intermediate AMD? Can we, today, uh, prevent the progression of um, early and intermediate AMD to the later forms? Uh, and the answer is, to some extent. Um, the ARITS-2 supplementation, uh, as found uh, in the ARITS-2 study and also built on the ARITS-1 study, uh, can decrease the risk of progression um, to the late forms, but with two caveats. One uh, is that the effect is only partial, uh, that it takes about a 25 to 30 percent discount of the overall rate of progression. And second, um, the protection, th this partial protection, is only for the uh, exudative form. Um, and if you would, on average supplementation, it does not decrease the rate of progression from the intermediate form to the GA form. So average supplementation does not decrease the rate of progression to GA, only to wet AMD. And it's also perhaps, um, uh, imp oh, excuse me. Uh, important to say that um, uh, in the case of uh, wet macular degeneration, can we treat wet macular degeneration? The answer is uh, yes. Um, that um, the onset of um, anti vegf treatments in 2006 have really made a sea change uh, in the overall approach towards this disease. Um, but however, uh, can we today in 2019 treat GA? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, we don't have anything that can slow down the rate of progression of GA once it has arisen. Uh, it's perhaps also um, timely to say that average supplementation uh, does not decrease the rate of GA once it has arisen. Uh, the rate of growth of GA, uh, whether on supplementation or not on supplementation, is not different from each other, as shown by the ARIS analysis. So given that that's the overall kind of uh, um, uh, scope of the way we are today, uh, perhaps we can dive in a little bit deeper into um, specifically GA. Uh, the definition uh, for the resonance is indeed uh, that this is a late stage manifestation of the atrophic form of advanced AMD. And clinically speaking, uh, we can see uh, that this uh, exists as a sharply demarcated area of um, hypopigmentation, uh, indicating a loss of retina and RP atrophy. Uh, of a minimum size of 175 microns in the biggest dimension. On the reading center level, this is varied from 175 to 400. Uh, and through this error of um, atrophy, we can see an increase of visibility of uh, corroded vessels underlying it. This clinical definition is helpful for us to make the correct diagnosis to some uh, masquerading syndromes, but also important on the reading center level to uh, monitor, define, and measure um, the limit of the lesion of time. On fundus autofluorescence, uh, our life is made easier by a higher contrast view. Uh, the RPE gives out a overall uh, degree of autofluorescence, and in absence of RPE, a sharply uh, demarcated area of uh, decreased autofluorescence observed in the GA lesion eye, uh, both on um, blue and green light excitation. And um, given that um, these perspectives have been well established, uh, um, the field has been turning more recently uh, to defining GA uh, on OCT imaging. Uh, and uh, a consensus group has uh, kind of defined um, um, OCT, uh, a GA and OCT as a zone of RPA loss of greater than 250 microns in diameter. Uh, you can see um, this is the region they're talking about, the absence of uh, RPE cells. 
and uh, with that uh, accompanying uh, overlying um, decrease in overall retinal thickness and photoreceptive degeneration in this area. And because the choroid can attenuate the signal that passes into the, uh, the RP can um, attenuate the signal that passes into the choroid, the region of uh, RP breakdown is also highlighted by this region of uh, hypotransmission into the choroid. So these features help um, one recognize uh, GA on OCT and also allows the reading centers to define and measure the progression of GA. And lastly, um, events in um, OCT and geography has allowed us to observe uh, flow in the choroidal circulation. Uh, and certainly in the GA lesion, uh, we do also observe uh, there is a loss of these fine uh, features that represent the choroid capillaries in the GA lesion itself. Although the large, GA, uh, large vessels are well observed in the GA lesion, the dark empty spaces in between these large vessels indicating the loss of choroid capillaries and the emergence of these flow voids. Uh, so clearly from OCT, you can see GA is a multi-level uh, disease extending from the retina into the RP into the choroid. And these perspectives have been uh, supported um, on histopathology. Uh, if you look at the retinal section, you can see a clear zone of um, uh, atrophy in the GA lesion. And zooming in on um, the edge of the lesion, we can observe um, paralyzing with OCT, a loss of RP cells and overlying photoreceptor atrophy. And uh, Jerry Luddy and his colleagues have done great work in demonstrating that this um, loss of choroid capillaries seen on OCTA is indeed anatomically present. Uh, they mounted uh, in the form of flat mounts, um, RP choroidal samples, and um, examined zones in which the RP cells have been intact, moving into the transition zone and moving to the GA um, lesion centrally. You can see uh, indicated in the loss of brown, the loss of RP cells, and corresponding to that, also a loss of the choroid capillaries that comes along with it. So um, given that this is you know, how GA appears, um, the field has um, approached the question of asking, how does GA arise in the first place? Um, and in the ARID study, um, there have been uh, folks entering into the study with large reason uh, that have developed GA in the course of the study. So some years ago, um, Rick Ferris and Michael Klein had um, collected all the patients that developed GA during the ARID study and then walk them back in time to say what uh, was going on prior to the onset of GA. So this is an example of one of the patients that they had examined. Um, you can see that in 1993, some years ago, some of you were not born, um, and this patient had a large drusen in the center of the macula. And with time, uh, the number of drusen and the extent of drusen increased with the emergence of hyperpigmentary changes. And during the course of this progression, there is a regression of drusen in this particular area, an emergence of hypopigmentation in this region. And with the collapse of drusen, there's also uh, an emergence of a well circumscribed atrophic lesion um, that is known as GA. So this um, is how GA is born. And looking across multiple um, patients, um, Rick and Mike were able to um, confirm um, that the sequence of events leading to GA uh, is one of drusen regression of uh, large confluent drusen, and also the uh, often uh, the presence of hyperpigmentation, hypopigmentation, indicating RPA changes, as well as the emergence of calcified drusen that are described as refractile deposits. Um, and this uh, process of um, drusen regression leading to the birth of GA is also echoed in OCT findings, uh, in which more recently, uh, in which you can see in this particular case, a long-standing druse, which can be present for uh, many years, uh, undergoes uh, regression. We don't know what the trigger is. Uh, and with that regression, there's also a subsequent uh, loss of RP cells and photos of the cells and an increased transmission into the choroid. Um, in a smaller study we've done at NIH, uh, we also looked at um, patients with intermediate EMD that demonstrate druse and regression. Um, in the early aftermath of drusen regression, as seen in this uh, fundus picture over here, uh, the drusen uh, following regression, this area looks quite um, unremarkable on the clinical examination uh, at first. Uh, but even at this early time, we can see stigmata of RPE change in this region, indicating that drusen regression is accompanied locally in the same area uh, by degenerative uh, changes on the RPE layer, indicating that drusen regression may potentially be causally driving these degenerative changes. And um, given the choice of having drusen or not having drusen, we usually choose not to have drusen. 
Um, but it's also paradoxical that the regression of Drusen is the gateway towards um, uh, atrophic pathology. Um, so uh, investigators some years ago have asked the question, uh, can we um, get rid of Drusen but not have the bad consequences that come along with it? Can Drusen be uh, induced to regress without negative consequences? Uh, so some years ago, Marie McGuire and Stuart Fine um, had um, organized the uh, CAPS study. Uh, this is a randomized clinical trial, uh, which um, employs a low-intensity argon laser causes minimal damage uh, to the retina um, in the treatment of eyes with uh, large drusen. It has been observed that uh, laser treatment of this nature can induce some degree of drusen regression. Uh, and if we use laser to induce drusen regression, would this be good drusen regression or would this be bad drusen regression? Um, so the overall um, result of the study some years ago um, uh, did not, however, demonstrate any um, changes in the rate of regression to advanced form of um, AMD um, with, uh, with the, in, in treated or uh, observed eyes. And specifically for GA, uh, both, the treated, me, both the treated eye uh, in the dark line as well as the observed eye progressed to geographic atrophy at the same rate, neither increased nor decreased. Um, this um, strategy was uh, more recently um, revisited by Robin Geimer and her colleagues in Australia. Uh, in this case, they didn't use argon, but use a, a different sub-threshold nanostacking laser that uh, does not induce um, retinal degeneration, but is capable of inducing Drusen regression. Uh, and they um, also uh, asked the question if this caused a decrease of progression to the late forms of macular degeneration. They have a small number of eyes in this randomized study. Um, the ultimate um, kind of bottom line was that it did not significantly change the rate of progression, although there's a, a lean towards decreased um, GA progression. Uh, but interestingly, in post hoc analyses, and we're dealing with very small numbers here, um, they did find uh, that in eyes that have large drusen, but no um, reticular pseudodrusen, that these eyes actually uh, were helped, um, apparently, by laser whereas eyes with drusen and pseudoreticular drusen were um, hurt by laser in the sense that they progress to advanced disease at a faster rate. So um, does, does laser treatment work only in eyes lacking uh, reticular pseudodrusen? Uh, that's something to be um, uh, considered for the future. Uh, but uh, it's likely that we've not heard the last of the drusen regression using laser as a potential therapy. I'll mention very briefly uh, other ways of trying to get Drusen to regress. Uh, Demetrius Vavas and um, Joe Miller at uh, Mass Einger had uh, published a, a small study in which they treated uh, patients with high dose um, uh, atorvastatin, 80 milligrams per day. Uh, there is the theory that um, Drusen formation occurs because of an imbalance of uh, lipid uh, transport in and out of the choroid from the retina. And so if you were to um, change this balance using atorvastatin, perhaps it can change um, the accumulation of drusen. So in the small study, in the half of the patients, less than half, they found that um, um, these patients over a course of 12 months demonstrated drusen regression um, that uh, perhaps was, they thought, um, unexpected from the natural history of the disease. So whether this is something that will bear further fruit or remains to, uh, to be found. Um, so once um, drusen is born, uh, how does, um, uh, sorry, once GA is born, how does um, GA then subsequently progress? I think everyone is familiar uh, with the rate of uh, expansion of uh, the GA lesion once it occurs. Uh, this um, uh, movie uh, shows that to some extent. <coughs> and patients that uh, have um, a scotoma form during the birth of GA will see the scotoma uh, increase and deepen uh, with time. Uh, and uh, visual acuity also progressively decreases the functional time too. And this overall progression of GA also seems to be a little bit different and, and this phenotype from the initial birth, in the sense that uh, the um, sudden uh, regression of drusen is not a precondition. Instead, it spreads progressively as a burning uh, brush fire, as it were, um, uh, extending from the center out to the periphery. Um, so uh, to recap, uh, where are we in 2019? Uh, we do not have a way to pre uh, prevent the formation of um, GA. We don't have a way to treat or uh, slow down or arrest the progression of GA once it's arisen, and suddenly we don't have any uh, treatment to restore whatever uh, vision has been lost uh, in GA. Uh, so our challenges are in front of us are, are large, and, um, and in thinking about this, 
uh, scientists have been going back to the lab and asking, do these clinical observations give us some ideas about what the underlying mechanisms might be? What are the specific processes that we can think about uh, in terms of trying to come up with something that can be a successful intervention? So in the lab, we've been uh, having this conversation with us ourselves. Um, this is a list of questions for which I don't have the answers, but I'll pose them anyway. Um, the question may be phrased, uh, how and why do Drusen form? Uh, what are the cellular sources of Drusen? Where do they come from? Who makes them? Um, RP cells seem capable of making many components of Drusen. Um, Greg Hagerman here has also suggested that immune cells may also contribute to some extent to the composition of Drusen. Uh, and also proteomic analyses have also speculated on whether the circulation um, brings in proteins, uh, they also contribute to the formation of Drusen. Um, and this, uh, where Drusen comes from, uh, may be an important part of um, preventing Drusen from forming in the first place. Uh, there's also the other uh, side of the uh, question. Uh, perhaps formation is only half of the um, balance. There's also a clearance of a Drusen. Maybe 17-year-olds make Drusen all the time, but they're successfully cleared. Is there a decrease in clearance, and what mechanisms might apply? Um, it's been proposed that a lipid barrier to diffusion of Drusen material from the retina may be a factor, uh, as are uh, the uh, chorocapillaris atrophy. Maybe the pipes that take away Drusen into the circulation uh, are decreasing with age and uh, allowing the uh, formation of Drusen. So some of these perspectives, we feel, uh, may be important in thinking about what, how to prevent Drusen formation. And uh, leading back to GA, uh, how do we um, uh, understand uh, Drusen regression that gives rise to um, GA. Uh, the Druze is actually a large structure, and when it regresses over a course of a few months, what is actually contributing to that regression? Who takes the Druze away? It's been proposed that uh, immune cells were capable of phagocytosing material might contribute. It's also been proposed that RPE cells, which phagocytose other segments every day, might also turn its attention to Druze to participate in the phagocytosis. And uh, Christine Gertio, um has also proposed that Drusen regression may be a passive process. The RPE cells may be making Drusen all this time, but when they're sick, they stop making Drusen, and the Drusen naturally regress through a lack of production. Um, so I think that uh, this idea about Drusen regression and uh, what drives it may be something that's important <coughs> to think about. And also, um, the consequences of Drusen regression. So Drusen regression doesn't happen um, often without uh, atrophy, but how do we link to these two aspects? Uh, how does Drusen regression result in death of RPE cells for receptors in choral capillaris? What are mechanisms uh, that cause RPE cells to die? Might there be some processes happen within cells, uh, such as oxidative damage and inflammasome activation? Or is, are, are these cells killed from the outside, from, perhaps from immune cells that are found in the site of the lesion? So these, uh, and also uh, with all these um, uh, hypotheses that can be generated, there's also a set of molecules uh, that have been implicated in um, genetic studies that indicate um, about 34 loci uh, that have been linked to AMD pathogenesis. How do these uh, processes, if they're relevant, relate to these molecules is something that the field is working on also. Uh, to extend the um, argument a little bit, not only to the birth of GA, but to the progression of GA, we're also looking at a, a phenomenon which is happening across multiple layers of the retina. And there's also the question about which uh, effects are primary and which effects are secondary. Does the death of RPE cells drive the death of photoreceptors or vice versa? Uh, and that's something that the field is also dealing with. And also, the, there's also the uh, expansion of GA. Um, if your RPE cell is uh, next to a dead RPE cell, the chances are that um, your undergoing degeneration are much increased. How is that driven and what's responsible? And that's something that's also being thought of. Um, lastly, um, um, GA is not perhaps a, only a local problem. Uh, there's also indication from um, adaptive optics imaging, and also perhaps FLIO imaging. That the overall macula is also compromised as a whole uh, in the disease. That the overall ground for GA expansion is actually undermined, and the retinal sensitivity in these regions are also decreasing. Uh, how do we understand a more uh, global change that's going on? How do we strengthen the uh, retina as a whole uh, to these degenerative processes? So uh, I, I wanted to kind of list up all these uh, overall thoughts um, and provide an overall framework um, in thinking about GA. And uh, perhaps in the last part of the talk, I'll talk about some of the approaches we've taken in following some of these leads. Um, so one aspect that we've followed is oxidative stress. Uh, certainly in oxidative stress, there is uh, uh, increased um, 
uh, is found to be increased with aging. The macula is a very oxidative, actively active environment. Uh, and with age, these changes due to oxidation accumulate with time. And there's no better example than smoking. Uh, smoking does a markedly increase um, the rate of um, AMD. I tell my patients that if, if there's one thing you should do, um, uh, is smoking, just stop smoking. Um, that's a, the, perhaps the largest uh, environmental contributor to the risk of AMD. You can see from these graphs over here that regardless of your genotype, uh, that can um, progressively increase the risk of progression. Uh, for all the genotypes that are shown here, uh, smoking uh, in these back row compared to um, non-smokers uh, increases the risk uh, for all <coughs> genotypes across multiple genes. Um, and um, Jim Hannon and his group have also shown at Hopkins that uh, oxidative stress can decrease cytoprotective protective mechanisms within RP cells, causing RP cells to become, perhaps become uh, more um, vulnerable to, um, de uh, to degeneration. <laughs> so with that in mind, we, um, some years ago in 2006, we tried to pursue antioxidants as a um, uh, as an avenue for treatment. Uh, in this study, we use a class of compounds known as perpyridine nitroxides. These are free radical scavengers. Uh, and uh, we have used this formulation of medication, which is a lipophilic compound that can, uh, when given as an eye drop, can pass through the cornea and sclera, and within the eye be converted by intraocular asterases uh, to this compound, Tempo H, which is a free radical scavenger. And this compound in uh, in vitro studies seems to protect RP cells in vitro, and also in animal studies uh, seem to protect um, the retina from uh, light-induced injury. So uh, with that in mind, we uh, recruited patients with bilateral um, GA. I can see from these pictures, uh, individual patients, there's a high degree of symmetry between uh, left and right eyes in, um, in these cases. And there's also a good correlation between the rate of growth in the left compared to the right eye. So what we did is to randomize our patients to receive the eye drop treatment in only one eye and use the fellow eyes as a control in order to try to detect a signal. Uh, unfortunately, although we found that uh, the eye drop was well tolerated and associated with few side effects, uh, in this report we did not find that the eye drop resulted over the course of three years any significant effect on the rate of expansion of GA. Uh, it also did not have an effect on the overall um, uh, retina sensitivity around the lesion. It didn't seem to rehabilitate the retina that has not yet undergone degeneration. Um, so I think that this uh, approach towards antioxidation uh, is still something that is worthy of consideration. Perhaps there are better um, uh, agents out there. Um, certainly, we, um, there are still uh, other folks that are interested in pursuing this strategy. Uh, another strategy that we also thought about um, uh, relates to the immune response. And, um, and certainly, the reasons for, for thinking about that are multiple. Um, for example, in the GWAS studies, uh, multiple genes have been uh, indicated as being um, important in AMD risk. Uh, and many of these genes, including the list over here, have been found to, uh, to be expressed by immune cells. Um, and, um, and you can see that some of them are uh, complement genes that uh, have been featuring a lot in AMD pathology, but also some genes such as tgf beta r one APOE, and also uh, recently PIL-RB and PIL-RA, uh, which are expressed by immune cells and influence immune cell activation. Uh, and certainly, immune cells are found at the scene of the crime, at the edge of the GA lesion, if you can see activated immune cells um, close to where the degenerating RP cells are. And there have also been a number of animal models uh, in which manipulating uh, immune um, cells as well as uh, uh, providing uh, immune uh, in changes uh, can induce changes in the retina that, that resemble um, AMD in some extent. So with all this in mind, we thought that perhaps we should think about GA uh, treatment uh, in the form of immunomodulation. Um, so we uh, started, uh, we did perform these trials involving um, serolimus of rapamycin, which is an uh, inhibitor of a protein kinase called mammalian target of rapamycin mTOR. And this is, of course, an uh, immunosuppressive medication used in uveitis, uh, but also FDA approved for as an immunosuppression post renal transplant, and also placed in um, uh, angioplasty stents to, um, provide, to prevent restenosis. Um, so with this uh, immunomodulatory agent, uh, we worked with um, Santin um, to create a formulation um, that is suitable for intraocular injection. Uh, we performed two studies, one involving subconjunctival injection every three months and also intravitreal injection every two months in an attempt to try to decrease immune activation within the eye to see if that is helpful for decreasing the rate of expansion of GI. Um, if, we, if this has worked, uh, we, you've probably heard about it. So uh, we did not find any positive results. Uh, we did not see any uh, large negative consequences, but neither the subconjunctival injection 
nor the intravitreal injection uh, resulted in the rate of decrease of rate of growth of GA. We saw some, um, uh, in one patient, we saw a strange um, expansion of the GA lesion and the thinning of the retina, um, but uh, <coughs> suggesting you know, in, in some situations this may be deleterious. Uh, but a larger study published last year, uh, as part of the ARIS2 <laughs> study using serolimus uh, intravitreally, uh, did not show any positive or negative effects. So um, we right now are um, perhaps narrowing our focus a little bit uh, and focusing on one um, group of cells, um, uh, microglia cells, which are innate immune cells that live within the retina. I'll be speaking a little bit more about these cells in the afternoon. Uh, and certainly these microglia cells, which live normally in your retina at all times, uh, are changed um, in their location, coming close to drusen and coming to the areas of GA, and suggesting that they may be abnormally activated and driving the rate of degeneration. So we want to see if uh, suppressing microglia activation in the eye might be helpful. So um, currently we're doing this study in which we're using a um, uh, FDA-approved agent minocycline, which is an antibiotic as well as anti-inflammatory. I have been shown in animal studies to decrease uh, microglia activation in the eye. Um, we're using also a, a novel design in which we're observing patients uh, without treatment uh, for a course, over a course of nine months, and then instituting uh, oral minocycline afterwards. Uh, from our preliminary natural history study, we find that the square root transform of the growth rate uh, across a number of lesion sizes is actually linear over time. Um, but, um, we, we, and, but however, if we introduce an intervention, we hope to see the bending of the curve in a way that um, uh, can reveal a signal. So each patient is its own control. Uh, each eye and the history of the eye in terms of overall expansion will serve as a comparison group uh, to the uh, effects of treatment subsequently. So we're doing this study using this um, novel um, approach and also a novel design, and hopefully we'll be able to find some signal going forward. Uh, others in the field have also been looking at immunomodulation, perhaps in a more molecularly specific level, uh, with respect to complement, and you probably heard a lot about this. Uh, I'll review some of this um, literature. Um, complement, of course, has been um, you know, featuring heavily in the uh, pathogenesis of AMD. And the overall broad theme, although this is not really substantiated by detailed clinical studies, is that overactivation of complement is something that is happening in the AMDI <clears throat> and driving degeneration in many aspects. The central molecule of, uh, of, um, of complement is C3, uh, and uh, cleavage of C3 gives rise to uh, the production of various mediators that can uh, facilitate immune modulation or cause um, uh, cellular lysis. Um, so, and this overall cascade is regulated by a uh, series of positive as well as negative regulators. So um, Roche, um, in their studies, have targeted one positive regulator called complement factor D. So complement factor D um, is a um, positive regulator uh, that can drive um, the activation of complement. So um, the investigators at Roche uh, reasoned that if they suppressed CFD using a drug they call lampadizumab, they can change the outcome of disease in the eye. So lampadizumab is a um, uh, FAB fragment, so it's an antibody directed against CFD. Uh, and although the phase two results published a few years ago were positive and showed that perhaps there was some um, efficacy, uh, the recently concluded phase three studies involving a large number of patients uh, did not show uh, any um, effect. So this graph shows the rate of uh, progression um, the rate of growth of GA in three groups, the sham group, um, uh, eyes that are treated every four weeks, eyes that are treated every six weeks. You can see that they overlap with each other exactly, uh, indicating a lack of effective treatment. Um, the phase two study also indicated that uh, patients with uh, polymorphism in a gene called CFI might have extra um, benefit. Uh, again, this study did not show any benefit based on that. So uh, the fate of CFD uh, in the field is a little bit uncertain right now. Um, but that has not stopped folks from looking at other targets. Uh, and the ongoing study right now involves um, C3, uh, the central molecule uh, involved in complement cascade. Um, this is a um, recently concluded phase two trial and ongoing phase three trial uh, where this drug, uh, Pacitagopin, uh, which is a, a peptide, uh, inhibitor peptide to C3, uh, is provided to patients um, uh, for a course of uh, 12 months, uh, given intravitually every month or every other month. Uh, followed by observation uh, from month 12 to month 18. The results of the phase two study are interesting and have been published last month. Um, they show that um, uh, the growth rate of the um, patients who are treated every month uh, was decreased uh, by 29%, uh, 
Uh, folks are treated every other month <coughs> decreased by 20%. Uh, but, and you can see these graphs showing that um, treatment was initially uh, quite um, subtle. Uh, the treatment effects are subtle at, in the early phase of the treatment. Uh, these are the treated arms versus the uh, sham arm. But uh, with the length of treatment um, towards months 6 and 12, there's increasing uh, difference between the groups, indicating a, more, a greater treatment effect the longer the treatment has been around. And when they stopped the treatment between 12, month 12 and month 18, uh, things became back to normal again, indicating that um, um, there's a good relationship between dose and between the presence of effect, uh, arguing that this effect is real. Most interestingly, perhaps, um, that this is, was not the only effect that the drug uh, was related with. There's also um, the uh, <coughs> emergence of new onset wet macular degeneration in the eyes that were treated. 20% uh, of the eyes, over the course of one year, developed wet macular degeneration with treatment uh, in, in, the, in the eyes that are treated monthly. In the eyes that are treated every monthly, this is a little bit, uh, is halved, uh, whereas the, um, the, the sham treated eyes had a very low rate of progression. So this is actually a, uh, also a real effect of the treatment that induces uh, wet macular degeneration in addition to perhaps slowing down rate of GA growth. So the, the, balance, the, the relationship between uh, wet macular degeneration and decrease of GA growth is something that the field is very interested in looking at. So uh, the phase three trial for this study is ongoing and recruiting. Uh, you folks may be a site. Uh, and uh, we're very um, interested in looking at uh, what this trial might show us. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, bring my comments to a close. Um, GA remains a big challenge uh, and uh, in 2019, um, is a disease that's without any prevention or no any treatment uh, or restoration at the current moment. Uh, folks that work in, in the labs are very much uh, involved in looking at the clinical clues that the patients are offering to us and looking uh, at the causes and perhaps the drivers of GA at each manifestation of the disease, uh, both in terms of its birth and also in terms of its um, growth. And uh, in the clinic, uh, uh, we are also very much interested in uh, uh, doing more clinical research, um, looking at clinical outcome measures um, to more precisely measure uh, and detect any uh, effect that we might see in clinical trials. Uh, we continue to invest in uh, phase two clinical trials um, on the proof of concept levels. Any phase two trials that show some efficacy will change and reorient the field um, as a whole. And of course, getting a, a, a treatment to patients will re require uh, confirmatory phase three trials uh, that can give rise to approved <coughs> treatment. So with that, uh, I'll um, thank my um, um, colleagues and, uh, at NEI and my uh, clinical collaborators, especially Emily Chu, Rick Ferris, Catherine Krukers, uh, and also um, Tian Nakina, who recently uh, left uh, Utah to come join us uh, at NIH, uh, and also our sources of funding. Thanks very much for your attention. Happy taking any questions. Yes, please. So obviously the quest for doing something about GA continues. Where's Paul? Did I see Paul? So there was a big headline of something about really exciting phase two, two A study about some modulation. I mean, this I'm talking. I'm, this was like a uh, you know ophthalmology times type thing but, but, that I just saw it and I didn't get in any detail, but. Did, were you, was, did anything strike you? I mean, they claimed like there was some early data. We've heard that so often that I take with the grants. These come and go, the phase, as yes. we can say. Well, and then I, I saw just enough that it did not reach statistical significance, right. which is so, <laughs> Yeah, many of these, as they say, if they're industry sponsored, are forward looking and they're looking you know, for, <clears throat> to keep going to the phase three. But, you know, I, to the NEI's credit, they're doing a lot of cutting edge phase two trials and really doing them right. And unfortunately, there's gonna be a lot of, a, a lot of things that don't work. And, but that's the only way we're gonna get forward. But what, what about the early, visual psychic? There, there was also some, some a visual cycling suppression for yeah, GA. We're involved in a lot of these trials. And, they're, and that failed as well. Yeah, they are, they're not, we're still looking at them. But yeah, for a lot of GA, it, it has failed. And they're now switching back over to Stargard to try to do Proof of principle in Stargardt disease. Interesting. Because if they can get something to work in Stargardt, then they'll go back to GA. But GA J has been difficult. But you can talk about how, you know, you're, there's a lot of trials you guys have done, and how, how you decide if you're the vast array to put the NEI's resources on these. How, how does that, how's that decision made?
Yeah, the selection of targets, and um, there are multiple, as I um, try to, uh, and, and in addition to, um, you know, immune um, modulation and oxidative stress, there's certainly visual cycle approaches. Um, there are additional molecules that um, have been implicated uh, as a course of the GWAS study. Uh, even if we don't know the function too well, such as HDRA or ARMS2, um, people are trying to design drugs and inhibit them in the hope that we might find something. I think that the limitation, uh, as it were, uh, certainly is, relates to lack of animal models um, and good animal models in which we can use to generate, uh, narrow down our field. Um, and so far, the narrowing down of candidates has been difficult to achieve. Uh, so as a result, um, proof of concept, um, trials that are perhaps easy to do, uh, have, there's an agent which is FDA approved and can be repurposed, uh, or an agent that looks um, like the risk-benefit ratio may be suitable. Um, so we can try to attempt those. So much of the decision making has been influenced uh, by accessibility to some extent. Uh, I think that as we dig deeper into the uh, molecular genetics of um, these processes, uh, perhaps we can um, get closer to a more judicious selection of targets. I think the field is changing all the time too with new basic science discoveries uh, that link well to the clinical observations. So if you find something, uh, that um, we see a recapitulation of phenotype as precisely noted, uh, perhaps that can be helpful. And we're looking at this um, disease all the time with new eyes too, perhaps using imaging technologies as FLEO to see something uh, that we haven't seen before that can uh, link to, uh, perhaps if FLEO indicates that um, um, uh, visual cycling is really abnormal uh, in, in much of the macula in the early course of the disease, that might reorient ourselves towards um, using uh, visual cycle modulation. We also limit it in terms of um, when and what stage we should intervene. And I think that the phenotypes of um, birth, progression, drusen are really distinct. And, um, and although the, gene, um, the genes implicated are broad in the sense that it applies to overall disease, a selection of the stage that's appropriate for finding a signal is also crucial. Uh, so we have a lot of questions, and we don't have a lot of tools for narrowing the field, but I think we in, in, in focusing on the problem, perhaps we can get a little bit closer. So at the NEI, we've just been looking at uh, things that are, uh, are ready for, for, for trial. Just, just one other thing that, uh, uh, we, so we've been looking at a large group of genotype, phenotype, pure groups pre going forward. And so we've been able to get a large group of uh, HTRI1 arms to pure homozygous risk. And we're amazed at how many of those will go wet or to GA and never have drusen. Yeah, um, I don't, did you, um, so I don't know how um, kind of small um, a fraction of um, the entire A&D population that might represent. That's a very um, small. Yeah, I Pure homozygous it's right. ten, it's a small group, but, yeah. but it's interesting. There, there obviously is a process that moves forward that does not have to have soft drusen. And, 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 and uh, they get reticular pseudodrusen quite often. Mm -hmm. But they're not they're not getting classical they're not getting classical drugs yeah. and it's it's a fair it's a fair percentage of that group and you brought up a really important point which is to say that do all, all the the way in which we understand AMD which is really a construct of the the Aris study mostly um, of large drugs and etc um, actually did not take into account of pseudo reticular drugs and because we couldn't see them at, at that stage uh, and if we included them would that change our classification and our understanding of so and so on and so, so forth. Um, if you didn't uh, take them into account, um, most people get to wet AMD or advanced AMD through Drusen. Um, very few do kind of take a different route. Um, but if you took them into account, then perhaps that can be you know, different. So we're trying to, um, we can't redo um, the average study because, you know. Because you know, the, 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 you know, they were not genotypes. Right. So yeah. But what we're trying to do now is trying to use AI, uh, artificial intelligence, to look at those fundus pictures for which clinical readers could not score reticular drusen and to see whether we can score reticular drusen. They and would have to, scored many of these people as normals. The, it, we reviewed the scoring system, and it was highly um, error prone just because we couldn't see them well, and I can see them well clinically too. Um, Fundus autofluorescence can show them up much better. Um, so we kind of, um, right now we're trying to train um, an AI algorithm uh, using Fundus autofluorescence and then look, have them look at historical data to be able to rescore all the images from errors to see whether a new algorithm, a new kind of framework can be driven. And perhaps some of these um, uh, genetic associations and how things work would become a little bit more common clear. Yeah. That'd be great. This place.
That's, That's a really, really good question. question. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, the, the, the trial was just published, and I encourage everyone to read it. It came out in ophthalmology last month. Um, and the editors had asked me to um, uh, write a short commentary to go with the, the so that's coming out next month, I think. So, but, and then I tried to kind of talk a little bit about your point, um, which is, in short, we don't really know. Um, in the study, um, the patients, um, when they developed bad macular degeneration, were, were kind of stopped and they, they dropped out of the study and they were not really followed. So data um, relating to them uh, was not really collected. Um, in the phase three study, I think there's a little bit of a gutsy move. Uh, they would continue to keep and follow those patients, give them anti-VEGF treatment, and continue to give them the investigation treatment at the same time without, uh, without discontinuation. Uh, so that will um, kind of give uh, some data about the question you're asking. But, um, you know, looking for if you want to predict uh, what would happen, and really it's not so clear, uh, would you kind of suppress um, wet macular, uh, neovascularization, and perhaps that will, uh, maybe that's an adaptive mechanism. If you suppress that, and, uh, the benefits of GA slowdown will go away. Um, can this wet macular degeneration, which is emerging in a very different context, be actually controlled well with anti VEGF? We don't know. Uh, so there many, uh, it's a very interesting situation, there are many unknowns. Um, I can't wait to find out what this phase three shows. Hopefully uh, there'll be good monitoring to make sure that the patients are not gonna be harmed uh, in the course of the study. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, thinking further upstream, talking about the you know, regression of Drusen leading to GA, it just with my superficial understanding, it would seem more likely it would be part of the natural history rather than something that's causative. Mm. Uh, and are we getting closer to understanding uh, that piece? I mean, you presented several potential mechanisms. Is, is there a horse to bet on at this point? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that um, the, the cause and effect uh, relationship between Drusen regression and the emergence of GA uh, seems to be quite um, good. Um, although there, I, I tell my patients that um, um, Drusen, although it comes from the German uh, word rock, are more like shifting sand dunes than they are in the rock gardens. Um, so there's a lot of flux that's going on um, in many patients. Um, so, but the fact that large amounts of Drusen regression uh, can be locally and temporally associated with, with atrophy, this suggests that the two are, if not causally linked, at least kind of temporally and spatially linked. Uh, if one of you assume that they are somewhat causally linked, then what is that process? Um, I don't think the field has a full understanding, but if you ask me to bet on the horses, um, I would say that um, the process of immune cell clearance um, is an um, interesting process. And this is true in Alzheimer's disease where amyloid plaques are also deposited, uh, to which immune cells are trying to clear, and that also um, is accompanied by a penumbra of uh, neurodegeneration. So the activation of the immune system to clear stuff that's not there um, may be a good adaptive process, but perhaps one that lacks sufficient discrimination um, so that um, the clearance also extends to cells that are required and needed. Um, so I think that that is some a perspective I would like to learn more about and study further. Steve. It appears in atrophic AMD that it's a real, not only a molecular genetics um, tremendous variation, but in the imaging patterns of the boundaries of the GA that define, I think, the, those patterns of the autofluorescence changes can define the rates of progression in those areas. Um, a number of uh, observations. We found that the photoreceptor ellipsoid junction and the ELM disappearance actually preceded the RPE atrophy and the geographic atrophy mm. and was related to the rate of progression. We found that the ge geographic atrophy around the optic nerve preceded and actually predicted the rates of GA progression. And the patterns of autofluorescence often would predict the local areas of progression. So, so th there's a tremendous variation here that we've got to somehow Try, as you said, there's so many things that are affecting it. How do we decide so we can define better um, methodologies to try to prevent this? 
company. Yeah, I think that those... <laughs> We're those, just mixing so many together, maybe that's <laughs> confusing yeah. our ability to separate. Um, absolutely. I think the um, Alan Bird, looking at um, kind of um, sections, I also can try to relate um, photoreceptive degeneration to overlying RP degeneration. And I have found quite a bit of variation across uh, individual patients. Um, um, Frank Holtz, uh, looking at different patterns, uh, have defined uh, trickling patterns that uh, confer increased rates of expansion. So certainly it's not just the burning border per se as the only factor, but also perhaps more ground factors, perhaps determined genetically, that can um, determine the overall vulnerability of, um, of the macula. How do we kind of put, how do we categorize and understand that? Um, it's been a long time since the uh, uh, event of, um, of autofluorescence imaging in GA, um, but uh, I think that uh, we still don't fully understand beyond the lesion itself what the patterns outside the lesion might mean. We um, are thinking about using artificial intelligence to try to tell us, uh, in which we followed um, patterns, uh, people with patterns over time. Uh, and of course, artificial intelligence is a great way of pattern recognition. Uh, it doesn't require um, uh, individual observation or individual observers making hypotheses. Uh, they look at everything and just pattern a sort across a large number of eyes. So hopefully we can uh, use that power to, to try to um, understand and categorize different patterns and assign significances to that. Um, so we don't know. So that's one tactic we might take in the future. Thank you. Thank you.